So we have two very amazing guests here with us today. So thanks everybody for showing up. Thank you to Zach and Margaret. Um, our first speaker um, is a 24 year veteran of Goodby Silverstein and Partners. Um, she leads the agency's creative department. She's done some amazing things in her years. She's led them to countless awards, including Agency of the Year by Forbes. Um, she has started a nonprofit, Daughters of the Evolution, with her 12-year-old daughter, Vivian, and um, has done some great AR work with that and won tons of awards. She is one hell of a badass. Please help me in welcoming Margaret Johnson. Hey everybody, thanks for having me today. Um, are we introducing Zach now too? Yes. 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 All right, um, awesome. So Zach, um, our other speaker, started at GSMP as an administrative assistant in 1999 um, and has since worked his way through the many departments of GSMP and now is the associate part is an associate partner and director of talent. Um, so with 20 plus years of advertising experience working at GSMP, um, as an associate partner and director of talent at Wine and Kennedy as a global director in creative recruiting and at Google overseeing global creative talent. Zach has been influential in shaping many of the best agencies. Hey everyone, super glad to be here. Good to see everyone. <laughs> So um, we have a presentation for you, uh, Margaret. Um, Margaret and I put together a great presentation, um, we hope, um, of some work that we've been doing. And um, I think Margaret's going to lead us through it. Awesome. All right, I'm going to try to screen share. I'm not great at this, so bear with me for two seconds. Yes. Did it work? Does everybody see that? I'm not seeing it. No, you're not? No. Oh. Sorry. You're not seeing that? Nope. Is any is anyone else? No. No. Okay. Hmm. Let's see here. Let's try one more time. Do you see the share button though? Like you do have access to share, right? Oh, there we go. Am I, am I doing it right now? Yeah, yeah yep, no, we can see it. No. All right. Did that work? No, that's at 730. Looks good. That looks awesome. good. All right, so I thought today, um, maybe we would just talk about storytelling and I could give you some of the, the juicy storytelling behind the stories, the stuff that you're probably not usually privy to that'll make each of these pieces of work a little more interesting and hopefully make you feel better as a, as a creative person. Uh, let's see here. Oh, not wanting to let me. Oh, it's not wanting to let me move forward. And does anybody have any ideas on this? Are you clicking the keyboard? I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm doing the arrows. How about just cl clicking on screen? <laughs> on screen? No. What do you mean? Like uh, on the actual yes. uh, document. Oh. Hmm. No. I don't know. I have a get ready. I was going to one more time. Oh. All right, is that working? All right. Yep. All right. So the uh, we're going to go through just a few truths about storytelling. The first one, and this is a, a real reality, is that storytelling is messy. It's very messy. And I think a lot of times, the more you feel like a campaign is going off the rails, the reality is it may be the closer you are to, to greatness. So I wanted to take you through um, a, a spot that we did a couple years ago during the Super Bowl um, for Frito-Lay. And uh, it, it, it stars Peter Dinklage and Morgan Freeman. So we're gonna watch it and then I'll tell you kind of the messy story, story behind it. Let's go! Cause I'm feeling like I'm running 
feeling and I'm feeling like I gotta get away, get away, get away. Better know that I don't and I won't ever stop. Cause you know I gotta win every day, day. Go. She didn't really, really wanna pop me. Go. Just know that you will never pop me. Oh. And I know that I gotta be a little cocky. Oh. You ain't never gonna stop me. Every time I come in and I gotta set it, then I gotta go in and I gotta get it, then I gotta blow it, and I gotta shut it. Any little thing and then I think that he be doing cause it doesn't matter cause I'm gonna dead it, dead it. Doritos Blaze, a bold new flavor that brings the heat. New Mountain Dew Ice, a clear, refreshing lemon lime dew. All right, so you're probably wondering, like, what's what's so messy about that? But the story that no one really knows is that originally, um, in the role of Morgan Freeman, we had cast Kevin Spacey, and uh, the, day, <laughs> the day that he was going to sign the contract, um, he got me too, and the whole story broke, and we had to quickly. Uh, recast and make another decision. And I think the, the very easiest thing to do would have been to pivot to Kevin Hart because um, PepsiCo had a deal with Kevin Hart. And um, I was just adamant that we, that we not use him because he actually has like a side rap career. So it was like unsurprising to see Kevin Hart rapping Missy Elliott. So I spent three hours in my car the night before Thanksgiving. It was freezing. I was in North Carolina and uh, trying to convince a, I, I had a conference call with 20 clients on it, trying to convince them that Morgan Freeman was going to be way funnier than Kevin Hart, uh, just because the humor was going to come from the unexpected nature of, of seeing Morgan rap Missy Elliott. So very painful, long phone call, but in the end we prevailed and we ended up casting, casting Morgan in the place of, um, of Kevin Spacey. So that's kind of the messy story behind that one. Thank God it, was sh it wasn't shot with Kevin Spacey and then ended up having to run. I know, or I know, not right? Run. <laughs> All right, it's doing this crazy thing again. It's not wanting to go forward. Huh, I don't know what's going on here. All right, there we go. Uh, great storytelling is risky. So this is really an example of a CMO, chief marketing officer uh, of a company. Again, it's Frito Lay, wanting to really do something out of the box. And this guy, his name was um, Ram Krishnan, and he came to me and said, "I want to get promoted. So I want you to present me with ideas that are really out there that are going to escalate me through." through PepsiCo. And so that's what we did. And we presented them with this idea called uh, Doritos Rainbows. And um, it was a rainbow colored chip. Uh, maybe some of you guys have seen it. It supported the um, LGBTQ community. Um, we launched it, which is, this is part of the, the really risky part from, from their point of view, um, in Dallas, Texas, one of the most conservative cities in the United States uh, during Pride and um, all hell broke loose. So people were walking off the lines uh, at the factory where they were making the chips. Um, the customer service line was so overloaded that the whole thing went down and Rom was getting death threats on his phone uh, at work. So here's, here's what we created and I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, I'm gay and... Um. Austin is too, and uh, we just wanted to like call and, and tell you. If you don't know, Tyler was a bright student at Rutgers University whose life was senselessly cut short. He was outed as being gay on the internet and he killed himself. Doritos has unveiled a colorful and bold twist on its classic chip. Let's look at the actual purpose of the bag. I think it's extraordinary. That is, I mean, in a way, that is the highest it's endorsement uh, that America knows how to give. It matters to me. Took a long time to get here. If it would have been easy, I would not have cared. 
Mac Doritos and has introduced a new kind of chip that might as well be called the coolest ranch. Thank you, Doritos, for releasing a new bag of rainbow colored chips. This will be the first time finishing a bag of Doritos has ever been associated with pride. You get lost in the heat. I feel so wonderful. Wonderful. It does get better. Nothing's worth ending it over. Mike Huckabee, Republican presidential hopeful, calling for a boycott of Frito Lay products by all good Christians. Wonderful the way I feel. So this campaign ended up being a little more effective for our own good because Rom did end up uh, escalating through PepsiCo. He got a larger role, uh, a VP role within PepsiCo, and he was ultimately named Ad Age Marketer of the Year. Uh, the next one, great storytelling is emotional, and it really makes you feel something inside. It elicits like a feeling uh, after you watch it. And this is a, a good example of that. Um, this is something that we did for Comcast. We did it during the Academy Awards. And at the time, Comcast was really a company that um, everyone hated. They were just not a beloved company and they really needed something that could boost consumer sentiment. So we created this. I think about the shape. I think about color. I also think about sound. I take it into my brain and I think about what would it look like to me? My tin man has a big toe the size of a house. The lion is small like a toy poodle and has webbed duck feet. And he is very scared of everything. My scarecrow has wooden teeth. His fingernails are really long. And his clothes have tubes on them. And that's Dorothy. She looks like me. Everyone has a favorite movie. Now, people with visual disabilities can find theirs. Introducing the first talking guide. Only from Comcast. So this spot caused like the, the largest spike in consumer sentiment that the company had ever seen. So very emotional and something that we're really, really proud of. We liked it so much, we brought the props back and put them in our lobby at the agency. <laughs> That's true. That's true. They're probably really dusty now. <laughs> um, all right. So great storytelling is also personal. We talk about this a lot at the agency that some of our very best work comes from when people feel passionately about something. If there's a problem that they want to solve, and this one um, hits close to home for me. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but I started a nonprofit called Daughters the Evolution with my daughter Vivian uh, about a year ago. And um, the, the mission of the nonprofit is to help girls create the world that they want to live in. And so we were looking around for our first project and a strategist came to me and said, hey, you know, the history book that your daughter is reading, 89% um, of the stories in that book are about men um, and only 11% are about women. Is there something that we could do to fix that? And this is what we came up with. Columbus, John Adams, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Madison. If you swipe like in the history book, you see like men in every single page. History absolutely has been his story. Um, history has been written by men for men.
One of the problems with textbooks is they've stayed the same for a long time. One of the really neat things that her story does is it sort of presents them with a whole new world. Her story is showing, you know, young girls that you can do amazing things too. It's not a man's world. This app literally has the power to change history. It changes history, it expands history, and it empowers the person who's using it. A lot of story gives me like confidence because I know that she did it, so you know, I could do it too. So this uh, app has been adopted by lots of school and um, they've kind of woven it into their curriculum. It's, um, it's been picked up. You saw some of, the, some of the logos by the UN, Fast Company, um, Davos did uh, a series of tweets about it. It's, it's free on the app store. They're promoting it as one of the apps that helps um, stop racism and promotes equality. So pretty proud of that one. Great storytelling is also simple. And I, we really found this during COVID too, that just the simpler the idea, the more successful it is. This is one that we did for Cheetos. And um, it really like focuses on the product. It's front and center. The whole idea is built around the Cheeto. Uh, we were seeing in, in social that people were posting pictures of their Cheetos and what they saw in them. So maybe it's the Eiffel Tower or Abraham Lincoln or the Loch Ness Monster. They were seeing things and posting it already. So we decided to, to ride that wave of pop culture and create a museum showcasing, showcasing Cheetos. It's doing that thing again. It's so weird. Hmm. I'm Madison Papple, owner of the Cheetos Abe Lincoln. You can see the two eyes there. And then right there, a little speck, that's where the nose is. There's a Cheetos, <laughs> there's a Cheetos museum. I there is. There's the little crown, her crown, and the, the torch, and the torch. In front here, that's where her book would be. I have Cheetos that look like uh, King Tut, Cheetos uh, Dolphin, Cheetos Eiffel Tower. This is my favorite story of the day. How would you like to make money eating Cheetos? Did you hear that Cheetos is offering <coughs> $60,000 to anybody who finds a Cheeto that looks like somebody famous? Your wacky, weird-shaped Cheeto <laughs> can now earn you up to 60 grand. Well, Cheetos is calling on people to upload their pictures of Cheetos that are accidentally shaped like something else. The winner uh, will get $10,000. It's a boot. Yes. It's a Cheeto boot. <laughs> A Cheetos Museum is giving away thousands of dollars. There is a Cheetos Museum. This guy decided that his Cheeto looked exactly like Harambe. A Cheeto Harambe? Sold on eBay for nearly $100,000. <laughs> so the client was really strict about um, we couldn't adapt any of the Cheetos at all. So you should have seen our lobby. We had these giant tables spread out and all the interns were going through bags and bags of Cheetos trying to find ones that, that looked like something. <laughs> so that was, that was an experience to see as you came into our lobby for sure. Um, next up, great storytelling is sticky. Now, if you ever work on an insurance company, you will soon realize that 
uh, brand recall is everything. And so we decided to just bake brand recall into this ad. So we came up with a really sticky, um, I call it an earworm. It's a, it's a tagline that like you just cannot get out of your head. Uh, and we also, you'll see in the backdrop, we have the Statue of Liberty um, so that it just is baked into the whole idea. Liberty Mutual customizes. Wait, am I in one of those Liberty Mutual commercials where they stand in front of the Statue of Liberty and talk about how Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance so you only pay for what you need? Uh, yes. Huh. What happens in this one? Seagulls. Oh, I like it. How are you doing? <laughs> only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Great riches will find you when Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance. So you only pay for what you need. Wow, thanks, Oltar. How can I ever repay you? Maybe you could free Zoltar? Huh? Thanks, lady. Taxi! Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 liberty. I swear, it doesn't matter how many times I watch the, that pigeon spot, I'm always like, <laughs> when they attack him. Um, this next one is, um, you know, great storytelling is bigger than you. And uh, the, there are two guys, two black guys that work in the agency, they're associate creative directors, and they wanted to do a campaign highlighting racial bias. And it's something that they had dealt with personally their whole lives. And they have wanted to create a campaign that helped stop it, but also had a greater impact on the world. Hi, um, can I get the now bar please? No problem. One dollar. Have a good one. Got it. Hi, can I get a now bar, please? Yeah. Uh-huh. One dollar. Thanks. Hey, what's going on? Hey. Hey, uh, let me get a now bar. Sure. One dollar. Appreciate you. You got it. How's it going? Can I get a now bar? Great storytelling is also opportunistic, and that means constantly just being at the ready. Um, we were seeing deep fake um, a lot, and uh, typically, as you know, like deep fake is used for bad. And we were we were working with we have an innovation lab at the agency, and we were asking them um, about ways to use deep fake for good. And uh, one of our clients is. Um, the Dali Museum in Florida, and this is what we came up with for them. I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech, and I am back. Even though Dolly's been gone for 30 years, we're using artificial intelligence to bring him back today. Deepfake is an AI technique used to recreate one person's face over another. We trained a neural network based on archival footage. So our system learns exactly what he looked like and applies every little detail of what makes Dali Dali to digitally recreate him in his prime. Dali dream in glorious technicolor. Dali dream in glorious technicolor. Wait. 
greetings. Nobody before me had the idea of painting a melting watch. This day, Tuesday. If you need PP now, it's down the hall. You will take a picture with me? This technology allows people to imagine for a moment that there is such a thing as immortality, to see Dolly alive again. Great storytelling is visual. Uh, Adobe is one of our clients and they were having their 25th anniversary and wanted to, they decided just at the last minute they wanted to be on the Oscars. So two weeks before the Oscars, we were scrambling to try to come up with an idea and we decided we would just make it in-house ourselves. We were gonna take the imagery from Photoshop and actually turn it into a commercial. Now, just so you know, like typically if you're doing a big commercial like that for the Oscars or for the Super Bowl, you would start six months in advance. So this was done in two weeks in the house. Every time I look in the mirror, all these lines in my face getting clearer, the past is gone. So one of the things that has really been highlighted by just the whole pandemic is, is, is the maker group that we have inside the agency. And that's, um, we have a, a photo studio with our own in-house photographer named Quinn. Uh, we have an animation studio. We have a design studio. Design is really important to me. I went to Parsons School of Design and so did Rich Silverstein, one of the guys that, that started the place. So everything always goes through our design group. Um, we have our own um, production company called E-Level um, and down there you can edit, we can do music, we do all sound design, color, we shoot lots of things. So during the pandemic we've been able to make tons of stuff uh, and you've seen like a few things that we've made in the past that we're really proud of. This Adobe thing, the Dolly thing we made with our innovation lab in-house and they also made the AR app for her story. So we have a really robust group of makers in the agency and it's something that, that gosh, we've really been proud of since we've been home in the pandemic because we've been able to make tons of stuff. Great storytelling is, um, it's also collaborative. And I think one of the hardest things as a creative person is um, handing over your ideas. And so when you're um, making commercials, there's, there's a lot of that that happens. So, you know, you come up with an idea, then you hire a director to, to bring that idea to life. And then a lot of times you'll also incorporate um, a celebrity. And in this case, we brought Will Ferrell on board to help us with, with this idea. And then he had a lot of his own ideas. So you'll see some of those in this. Oh, 
Oh, it's so nice to all be sitting down together. You can tell me something they did today. Um, I drew a horsey. <coughs> Good for you, Sam. I started smoking. I love you too, sweetheart. I'm selling bongs out of our minivan. I got a tramp stamp. I'm getting implants. I'm dating your brother. Uh-huh. I'm cooking meth in the basement. Great idea, kiddo. That's why you're so popular at school. So as hard as it is, I think a lot of times, especially when you're working with celebrities, you have to be willing to um, be open-minded and let them take your idea and, and make it better. And that's kind of what happened in, in this instance. Uh, he was really funny and really fun to work with. So I think that's all the, the work we're going to show today. You guys sent in a ton of, of questions too. So we're going to open it up and maybe now I can see you all. I've been talking yeah, to a blank screen. <laughs> yeah, we have a long list of questions from the students. Um, so we can just jump into those if you're ready. Awesome. Ready. Um, the first question is from Shannon Gill. Um, and she said, what is something you've seen on a portfolio that stood out to you um, that was not a typical ad campaign or case study? Zach, you want to uh, you want to take yeah. that? I mean, in general, especially as a student, I think we're always looking for at least one thing that kind of sticks out that isn't just like a traditional ad. So, um, I mean, so many examples of of great work that wasn't just assigned at school. And, and one of the things that I usually encourage everyone to do um, in school is, you know, if you have a two, if you're in a two year program, if every quarter you just do like one side project. Um, and um, that is something you're actually interested in that actually is something that you would want to put effort into should it take off. Because if you do that, you should have eight projects by the time you graduate. They don't need to be big at all, um, but you'd have you'd probably have about eight little side projects that, that um, and if one of those were to get traction, um, it, will, it will really get you a lot of eyes for, um, for potential agencies. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of, specific projects that I can think of, but usually as a student, if you can just have a couple of little side hustles going on, um, if one of them grab, gets any traction, it makes my job a lot easier on, on who to hire. I think too, well, this drives Zach crazy, but I always like, I always start at the bottom of someone's portfolio. And so I look from the back up because I want to see the worst thing first. <laughs> and um, so I'll do that. But I also do, to Zach's point, look a ton at their personal work because it's unrestricted and you can kind of really see the personality of that person um, in that work. Our head of labs um, is a good example, our innovation lab. Uh, Zach and I looked at his portfolio. He wasn't, he wasn't from he, the ad world. He was actually, he barely even world. had a portfolio. It was just a, <laughs> a box of craziness. That's right. It was a box of craziness, including this like crazy drone art where he was graffiti spray painting on billboards, you know, out in the, in the world. In and Times Square. Yeah. We just like fell in love with like the, the passion behind the art and, um, Anyway, that's how he got hired. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, our next question comes from Jason Colleton. Uh, he said, what perspective changes have you had? Um, have you had in how you view your role as a creative as you've moved up the ladder um, throughout your career? Um, hmm. I think the one thing that hasn't changed is just like that, like fire and hunger. Like I just like to make stuff and I, I'm really, I talk a lot about firsts. I like to, to figure out how to do things that haven't been done before. So I think I've kind of always been that way and, and, and still am. As a creative director, I mean, as people mature and, and kind of move up the ladder, I think the thing that can be really challenging is you have to start giving away ideas. It, creativity is kind of, can be very selfish sometimes in the sense that people like they have their <laughs> idea and they want to own it and they want all the credit. And what makes a great leader is you have to start giving things away and, and you actually have to not be as into the credit and letting other people get the credit, which will make you get more credit in the long run, but letting people feel like that they're the teams um, that are, that are getting the credit will, will go a long way as a leader. And, and 
that's something as you as you grow up and, and mature in this industry, you have to start getting comfortable with is, is kind of giving away things. Cool, thank you. Um, third question that we have um, is from, from John Simmons. And he said, what would each of you say your philosophy or what would each of you say the philosophy is at GSMP and how does that philosophy align with your own? Uh, mm. For me, for me, I'm going to use an old slogan of ours, which is art serving capitalism. I still, I still love it. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but I just love the idea. You know, we live in a capitalistic society for better or worse. It's just the reality. And as a company, we really do try to bring as much art into what we're doing and into the world as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other one that we talk a lot about is something called mass intimacy. And it's really having the ability to speak to millions and millions of people, but have that conversation feel very personal, like one-to-one. -one. And we really try to bring a lot of humanity and emotion into every piece of work that we do. So we get that connection with people. Awesome. Um, so our next question from the list, um, it comes from Nathan. Bennett, he said, uh, for the past seven months, everybody has been working from home. In what ways has Goodby Silverstein and Partners gone beyond the sort of standard Zoom happy hour um, to keep everyone in their community, you know, the employees energized um, and to maintain that sense of company culture? We have a wide range of D-list to A-list celebrities who've worked in the agency over the years, <laughs> and um, and and in a time like this, we've we definitely tried to pull in some favors from some of those people, who range from um, a guy named Andrew Bancroft, who um, now has a Broadway musical, um, a pretty successful Broadway musical. So um, we've called him in, and we had um, we had like our own private showing of a of a impossible um, to see Broadway musical. Um, so we've, we've tried to pull in some of the talent who's worked in the company in the past to give us kind of special screenings or kind of behind the scenes stuff on some of some real world things that they're doing. We also, we do a, a meeting once a week, an all agency meeting where we all come together and sometimes we'll look at work. Sometimes we'll break out into smaller groups and have discussions about things. Uh, we also had an all agency talent show, which was really fun. And you got to see all the crazy, you know, talented people that we have uh, inside the agency perform songs and poetry and skits. And that was really, really fun. Uh, we also did kind of a spoof of, I don't know if you remember MTV Cribs, but we did GSP Cribs. So you got to like see the insides of like everybody's houses, everyone from you know, the most junior person to, to the guys that started the place. So uh, that's been pretty fun too. I don't know if, 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 if any of you know this or, or there's a guy named Lil Dickie who used to go to your school. Um, and then he also worked at our agency as a junior writer. And now he's obviously, he's gotten really big, but his first 10 videos and his album was recorded at our company. And so um, every, every once in a while, we also kind of, think about pulling him in to, during these quarantines are the ways that we can get him to kind of make pick up the energy a little bit in some of our meetings. <laughs> I love little Dickie. <laughs> um, next question. No, is, he went to, he went to school in Richmond, didn't he? Someone saying he went to U of R. I'm yeah, pretty U of sure. R. No, he went to VCU. Oh, we also you look at, if you if you look at his album cover, it has his resume and it says it has University of Richmond written on it. Oh, it does. I always thought it was VCU. Mm -mm. He went to. Well, well screw him. <laughs> <laughs> he did work at the agency, though. That part's real. <laughs> He's still Richmond blood. We still claim him. <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, the next question is from David Ligon, and this might pertain more to you, Zach, I'm not sure. Um, in this new normal, finding talent has obviously changed. As we approach our graduation and begin our job hunt, how can we make our recruiter session successful if we're forced to have it online? Um, 
And then how would you like to see that partnership flourish from your perspective as a recruiter? My guess is, I mean, I would prepare everyone to start thinking about how to answer this now because it's what we're basically in November and your recruiter sessions usually in April. Mm-hmm. And my guess is you're not going to get 150 recruiters to all get on planes and fly and be in a, a large room right now. I mean, even in April, I could be wrong. I mean, things could change, but my guess is this is, um, it's, my guess is your recruiter session will probably be mostly remote. So, I mean, I would really challenge you to answer this question because um, how you can stick out in an interview is always is always a good thing. Um, little subtle things can go a long way and um, figuring out how to make a Zoom call a little more interesting and less mundane for the viewer um, as a creative person should be something you should start thinking about now. Okay, awesome. Um, so the next question um, Grant comes from Grant Tolson. I know he's been biting at the bit to get an answer to this one. Uh, if Goodby Silverstein and Partners was the dinner entree, what would it be? And what are the reasons I'd want to order it? Grant, I know Grant. I like Grant. How's it going, Grant? Good to see you. <laughs> we were talking, I think, yeah, we were talking before you were in school. It's a, it's, I don't know how to answer this question exactly, but the one thing I would say, and one of the reasons I've, I've stayed at this agency for so long and that I love it, is it's not a one-tone place. So it wouldn't be a place that's just known for one entree. Um, I said it would, be a, it would be a poo-poo platter. <laughs> it's got a little bit of everything. Yeah, you know? we yeah, like a great tapas restaurant or something that has lots of things because you know the, there are agencies where you can go where it's just you know they're going to do one thing and that's what they do. But but we have, you know, Margaret oversees a, a large group of our of creative directors and they're all so different. You know, we have amazing comedian writers. Um, we have people who couldn't write a word of comedy, but they can do the most amazing kind of um, technology pieces and, and everything in between. And our client and our client list is the same. I mean, we have things from um, BMW, big you know, big client based in Germany to a, a Bay Area sports team. So we, we have, we, we've never been one tone and one dimensional and it's a place where the, a, a lot of different type of, types of people can, can find their own home. Oh, thank you. That is a very spicy meatball. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is from Amanda Tao, um, and she says, how do you embrace diversity at GSMP and what retention structures do you have in place to keep diverse talent? Well, we have lots of groups within the agency, which has been awesome. We have Black GSP, we have Latinx GSP, we have um, we have Asia, G- Asian GSP. So we have lots of different smaller groups. So each community feels like they are supported. Uh, you saw Not A Gun. So we uh, work with a company, I don't know if you saw at the end, but it's called Courageous Conversation. And um, we partner with them, like putting things out into the world. Um, but we also use Courageous Conversation internally as a tool to help us um, understand bias and how to deal with that. Um, and we do a lot of workshops and things like that with them. We just hired our first um, head of diversity, uh, Dr. Jennifer Gomez, and she's been amazing, and she's doing um, internal clinics with us. She's doing four a week, actually, uh, since we've been um, sheltering in place the last few weeks, and we've started that, and that's been really successful, too. Zach, you want to talk about, like, our stats and stuff like that, like what our goals are? Yeah, I mean, we we have, I mean, it's it's a, it's a work in progress. I mean, I think we're we um, we're hard on ourselves, so we always want to be better. And um, you know, as a creative department, we 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 generally match the 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 country's stats on diversity. Um, and um, but we, you know we're always pushing and, and honestly, we're better. We know we're better. The data is there. We're better when we, when we, when we are diverse. Um, so we're always pushing for it. And, um, and, and we know that it actually literally makes us a better, uh, a better agency. We also just joined, um, free the bid. 
So what that means, it's an organization, a nonprofit that um, you can can join as an agency and promise that it's like, so typically like when you're bidding out a, a commercial to shoot, you'll uh, do a triple bid. So you'll talk to lots of directors, you'll narrow it, narrow it to three and get their actual treatments and then a bid from that person. Well, one of those three has to represent a minority group for us um, now. So that's been pretty great too. Yeah. And John, John just asked in his text if we utilize diverse creatives.com directory. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of good resources, especially that have come out in the last few years um, for, um, for recruiters as far as finding different diverse um, talent. We actually started, I don't know if anyone here goes to um, Where Are All the Black People, which is an event the One Show hosts um, in, in New York. That was started by us. Um, and um, so for the last 10 years, we've been really involved in that. And, um, and it started really with um, a black employee saying to our owner, to one of our founders, Jeff could be, he said, Jeff, where the hell are all the black people? And um, so Jeff started an event around it to um, bring awareness to uh, great uh, diverse talent out there. So today, this was its 10th year and, and something that we um, are proud to have started and, and keep putting a lot of um, effort into. We also, um, I don't know if you have seen any of these, but um, since we've been out of the building, well, we were doing this even before we left the building, but we've been doing it a lot more since we've been out of the building, but we're using the windows in our building um, as kind of our, our voice. And so um, on the heels of, of Not A Gun, we did another campaign, uh, Being Black Is Not A Crime. And um, so we've had that up in our, in our windows uh, right now uh, during uh, the election, we have vote harder up in the windows. So we're using that to amplify our messages. Oh, sure. great. Oh, awesome. This is, this is um, um, right after George, the George Floyd stuff was, happened. We, uh, we changed, I mean, we're an advertising agency and we have this big, beautiful building on, on the most like iconic street in San Francisco. So we said, let's start using our windows um, as a media space. So um, we, we regularly change out our windows based on different different kind of things going on in the world. All right, great. Um, the next question comes from Paige. Um, she says, what, what is Goodby's take or, um, on work-life balance since mental health is an emerging conversation topic within the industry lately? Well, I mean, one of the things that I think has always been part of our philosophy is you can only make good work. Good work comes from interesting people. And in order to be interesting, you have to get away from work. You have to be able to go out into the world and have a life and see your friends and go see plays and museums. And you have to get inspiration from outside um, of the hall, uh, outside of our building. So um we, we always have taken work life serious, very seriously. Um, and um, during COVID it's, it's been, um, you know, it's been hard for everyone. I think the, the whole industry, um, we're de definitely working more than usual. Um, but um, compared to most agencies, I think we have a really good work-life balance. And a lot of the times, um, a, a lot of the times people who especially move from New York, New York has a really cutthroat kind of advertising culture. It takes them like a year before they really settle in and they're like, whoa, you guys are actually nice and you don't actually expect me to be here like 24 um, seven. So I think, I think we try to have, you know, people work really hard and we have high expectations of people, but um, how they do their work, where they do their work, um, the fashion that they get it done in is really left up to them. Mm -hmm. I think too, like just my very worst days are ones when I start here at eight o'clock and then at, you know, seven or eight o'clock, I'm still sitting right here. So I really try to work on transitions and make sure that like, if I'm stuck that I get up and like, you know, go walk around the block or I switch rooms or, you know, just change your environment really helps. Like when you're coming up with, with ideas and to Zach's point earlier, like, experiences are it's like gathering ideas in a basket right you experience lots of really cool things whether it's art or movies or film festivals uh, music 
anything you can, you're, you're gathering all of those things and those things will show up in your ideas later. And they'll be way fresher than the people who are just studying other ads. Uh, and someone just asked in the text about, in, do we have any international creatives at GSP? I love this question because oh, yeah, our, our creative department is literally the United <laughs> Nations. And I take great pride and probably drive our lawyers crazy um, because of all the visas that they have to apply for. But um, yeah, our, our creative department is wildly diverse as far as different countries. And and honestly, uh, it, honestly it's at least... 40% of our creative department is on some sort of visa from somewhere else. The good news about um, working with Rich Jeff and Margaret as a recruiter is they basically say, go find the best talent. It doesn't matter where they are, you know? So, so I get to, I get to um, talk to people from all over the world and, um, and we have a very, very, um, very diverse group of, of people from different countries. I love that because when you put, two people together that come from like wildly different places and have wildly different perspectives. It's just the tension that you need to come up with ideas that are just inherently more interesting. Great. And I actually had, oh, I actually had one more question here. Um, so I, during quarantine, I read a lot of articles about how quickly could be adapted production processes. Um, during coronavirus. And I was just wondering like how you were able to transition so efficiently and, and still produce the wide variety of work that you did. Well, two things on that front. One, I said earlier, like we ha already had this big makers group in place. I mean, they literally fill our third and fourth floors and work together. They were working together seamlessly in the building. So we did have the foresight when, um, we you know all knew that things were shutting down to send everyone home with with all of their equipment so all the animators um, everyone from the innovation lab everybody took their computers home and so we were just kind of it was business as usual we were just kind of making stuff and just because we couldn't go outside to to make it we were really well built and prepared to to do it inside Okay, great. Um, I had one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, it looks like that's about everything. Um, so as we're kind of in this age of brands taking up social causes and a lot of times for great reasons as they should, how do you sort of toe the line with brands who might not have a position to make a social stance on a certain issue? Sort of like how um, Pepsi and Gillette received a lot of backlash um, uh, in the recent years well the great thing right now is like it's like you're constantly in a live focus group so anything that you put out into the world you better be able to back it up because someone's going to call bullshit on it immediately so you really have to as a company think about what you have the right <laughs> to say and and only say those things and we just, you know, constantly remind our clients of that and encourage them to, you know, a long time ago, we did a campaign for, for haagen to help save the honeybees. And they had the right to tell that story because if the honeybees weren't there, then, you know, two thirds of their products were going to be wiped out. You have to have like that kind of investment in something to, to be able to say it. We actually got Pepsi because of that terrible ad that they made. It's true. I just want to clarify, we didn't do it because I said we did Pepsi <laughs> earlier. I'm just trying to make sure everyone knows that we had nothing to do with that. <laughs> Something good came of it though for you guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I think that's um, everything. We just want to say thank you again so much for giving us your time and coming to talk with us. It was a great presentation. I think everyone enjoyed it. So if that's all, thank you to Margaret and Zach. Awesome. Thanks, for Thanks so much for having us, everybody. Thanks.